Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. As a young child, you're taught there's nothing sweeter than the words of God. There's nothing better that you will ever acquire. There's nothing more fulfilling, more pleasurable than taking in, learning, and understanding God's Word to us. So children, this is where you're going to find everything your heart desires. Compare that with how we're raising our children today. Are we doing exactly that with them? Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines, pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. Hi and welcome to Today with Jeff Vines. In this episode, we have another message from the series called Jesus Resolution. If you miss any, you can find all messages in this series on your podcast app. Here's Pastor Jeff to begin today's message. Turn in your Bibles this weekend, if you would, to Numbers chapter 15. I'll be starting with verse 37 in just a moment. You know, there's a lot of us uh, who take a a good look at the world around us and there's there's deep concern. Uh, For myself personally, I just saw the movie, The Sound of Freedom. Uh, Jim Caviezel plays uh, a role in the movie where he's trying to expose and bring to justice those who are are participating all around the world in a, a ring of pedophile or pedophilia. And you watch it and you know it's based on a true story. And the more you watch it, the more you ask the question, are there really people this evil in the world? And is it really so rampant that there are people who would take young five, six, seven-year-old boys and girls and sell them into slavery? I mean, is that really possible? Someone could do that without a conscience or without guilt. So it's easy to look around and think that somehow the world today is worse or than it's ever been. But the reality is the only reason you and I know about these things, these things have been happening from the beginning. And the only reason you and I know about these things is through social media. So social media is good in some ways, bad in others. But we know now, we're aware of what's happening. We're, we're aware that actually the Bible is true, that the heart of man is wicked in every way. So I think we come to a time, especially in the West, we come to a time when we We desperately want people to understand the relationship between faith and things like justice and freedom and the sanctity of life. That culture tends to go from strength to strength when there is a faith system that is ingrained. And the faith system would have to be something that treats life as sacred, something that honors character and integrity. But that faith system, traditionally in the past, I'm not saying that these places are perfect. By no means, no culture is perfect. Every culture has a sin nature to it. But there is a sense in which there is, those cultures, those societies that tend to flourish, tend to be attached to a faith system that believes in the sanctity of life, that believes in the sacredness of marriage, that believes in justice and that injustice should be fought against and justice should be defended. So because we've arrived at this time in humanity, we have to ask ourselves the question of what's happened. But I have to admit that there's something desperately wicked in the heart of men and women. And I'm starting to ask what has been the change of the last 30, 40 years to get us to the place that we are now And as I've said before, my visit on university campuses, more and more I hear Christ followers on those campuses telling me that they're being taught to disdain any kind of religious system or faith system, especially Christianity. And in fact, as Christ followers, they're beginning to be persecuted. So the question is, what happened? And as I've stated in the past, it it is necessary not to point the finger and look outward, but to always do some introspection on the inside. And I remember 20, 30 years ago, hearing Christian parents make statements like this. They would say, you know what? I just don't believe I should force my faith upon my children. And I wanted to look at them honestly and say, you know what? Right now you're just being ignorant. Because make no mistake, this world system will force its beliefs and faith on your kids. So you're either going to teach them or somebody else is going to teach them. There's no neutral ground here. I've also heard people or young people say, you know, I wanted to become a Christ follower, but the faith that my parents mouthed was never really practiced. It was almost like faith and life became segmentable. This is what I do in my life, and this is what I do on the weekends at church. But what I believe doesn't necessarily match how I live. 
And the other thing that I noticed in the last century is that a lot of parents began, Christian parents began to take a cavalier approach to this thing called discipleship. So it's in that context that I want to read the text. It's again, I'm in Numbers 15, verse 37 says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So right in the text, right from the get-go, we are given commands by the Lord to his people. These commands, the law to which he refers, is called the Torah, which is representative of the first five books of the Bible. Torah itself is better understood as a word that reflects instruction. And this is important because here's the thought. The first people of God believed that God loved them so much that he would give him his Torah, his instructions, so that they would know how to live, so that God would say, I created you, I know how you best operate, so I'm going to give you a roadmap to successful living, health, wealth, and vitality. And knowing that most people, by the way, were visual, and we talked about how the Old Testament culture was a visual culture, I have a prayer shawl, and God told them to make one of these. Now, this is, a, this is not as primitive as the early ones would have been, but it's kind of based after the same design. And he told them to take the prayer shawl, uh, take the kanav, the border. The kanav is basically the material, but more specifically, the kanav is the border. And he said, take the kanav, and he said, attach to them what is called, what are called tzitzis. <laughs> it's an interesting word. And on the tzitzis, this extended extension out from the kanav, the border, there were five knots, and the five knots represented the five books of Moses, the law, or again, the instruction that God would give his people. It was his way of saying that I love you so much that if you live under the prayer shawl, which I'll demonstrate in a moment, if you live under this, then your life is going to be a life of health, wealth, and vitality. And so, and Jesus says in John chapter 10 that he came to bring life and life to the full. So God never wanted to be seen as the big, bad, cosmic boss, but as a father who loved his children. And he said, by possessing the prayer shawl, what we call the prayer shawl, anytime you felt that you were being tempted or dragged away from the law of God that is meant to save, not bind you, you're to take the prayer shawl and you're to put it over and you're to remember that you are covered in the precept and the law of God. And as long as you live under this covering, you'll be protected you will take hold of the abundant life. And actually a wonderful tradition developed uh, concerning what we call the tzitzi, the borders, the kanav. Kanav actually meant, means, it's a word that means wings. And you can see why, right? So if you put this over, you can kind of see why wings. And the tradition began that God's wings, the kanav, were the places of shelter and refuge. So if you lived under the law, the precepts of God, then that you'd be protected from things like danger and fear and destruction, panic, anxiety, all of the things that are part and partial to the human experience. If you take refuge under the wings of the kanav or the tzitzi, then you will be protected. And that's why I'm uh, protected. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, we read these words, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. So healing in the tzitzi, healing in the law of God, in the precepts of God. Again, God gives his law not to be the big bad cosmic boss, but to give you a way of protection. He knows best how life operates. He created you. He says, live under this law. Now that explains what happens in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20. We're told... Jesus is going through the streets, I believe, of Capernaum. And just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, the scripture says, came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Now, as soon as she touches the cloak of Jesus, Jesus looks around, his disciples are standing there. And he says, wait a minute, who touched me? And I'm sure the disciples in their mind would have thought, you know, it's a big crowd. Everybody's touching you. But Jesus knew someone had touched him in a unique way. He knew that somebody believed the text, that somebody believed he's Messiah, that he would have healing in his wings, the border of his garment, the tzitzit. She's trying to touch the border of the garment, 
because she believes there's healing in Messiah's wings, which means she believes that he's Messiah. In verse 22, Jesus turned to her, saw her, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Now, does that mean there are, there's magic in the tzitzit? Is there magic in the corners of the kanav, in the, in touching the tassels or the, the tzitzit of the garment of Christ? Well, no, of course not, because she's not healed until he, until he says you're healed. But that's exactly what he's, what he's done. He says, woman, your faith has healed you. And at that moment, the Bible tells us she was healed. So it's not a magical thing. It's just the thing that there was the belief that when Messiah comes, he would have healing in his wings, which means they're his precepts to us, as difficult as they might be to accept, would bring healing into our lives. The other thing that developed, another really cool thing, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, Jesus told the disciples that when you go into the temple, in order that you may not distract or be a distraction to others, enter into your closet. Now, we think that's kind of a place in the house. It's not, because when you covered yourself like this, and you began to pray, that was called your closet. So Jesus says, don't go out on the streets like the Pharisees and Sadducees and broadcast your prayers. Go into the temple, go into your private place, go into your closet so you're not distracting anybody else and began to pray. And those prayers that are uttered in silence or in private with God, those prayers will be heard and answered. Now, here's the question. All that's a lot of information, but the question then became, since the Torah, since the law, since the tzitzit, there's healing in his wings, which means or stands for the precepts of God. The, the question came, what age could you begin to teach a child the Torah? At what age could they begin to understand and observe the text? And of course, this was important to Hebrew parents because to the Hebrew parents, the words of Christ or the words of God, rather, were the words of life. So I want to get the words of life into the into the, the mind of my child as soon as possible. So the important question emerged, what age? What age? So parents, listen very closely. From the writings of Josephus, we have the, this quotation. Above all, we pride ourselves on the education of our children. So let me go back and say it again. They understood that the words of God, if, it, if the words of God, the precepts of God made their way deep into the heart and mind of a child, then they would flourish. However, and this is the key. If the words and the precepts of God did not make their way into the heart and mind of our children, then we were one generation away from being extinct. The word of God, the precepts of God are always just one generation away if they're not passed down to becoming extinct. In the Talmud, we read these words. Under the age of six, we do not accept a child as a pupil. From six upwards, we accept him and stuff him like an ox with the Torah. Isn't that amazing? So, I, th I find it interesting. We usually start school, we have kindergarten, but at age six, we call that first grade. This begins the first year of your proper education. So at age six, you entered as a young Hebrew child whose parents wanted to get the words of life into your life. You entered what we call stage one, which was called Bet Sefer. Now imagine this. Jesus is six years old. His mother Mary's taking him to school for the first day. There's no school bus. She walks him on the first day to school with his little Moses lunchbox and his WWMD, what would Moses do bracelet. And she marches him down to the local synagogue to school called Bet Sefer, which means, by the way, house of the book. And this lasted from age six to age 10. Now, a lot of cool things happen in these classes, but one of the things that happened that really interesting, the first day of school, the teacher would have them take out their slate on which they're going to write and learn and would have them pour honey on the slate. And then would tell the children, okay, children, take the slate and I want you to lick all the honey off the slate that you just poured on. And I want you to lick all the honey off your fingers and hands. Ezekiel chapter three, verse three says, I ate the words and it tasted sweet like honey. The, the teacher would basically say this, children, you start your education and may the words of God be the most exquisite, pleasurable, enjoyable, sweet thing that you've ever tasted. So as a young child in Bet Sefer, house of the book, as a young child, you're taught there's nothing sweeter than the words of God. There's nothing better that you will ever acquire. There's nothing more fulfilling, more pleasurable than taking in, learning, and understanding God's word to us. So children, this is where you're going to find everything your heart desires. Let me stop there just a moment. Compare that with how we're raising our children today. Are we doing exactly that with them? 
Are we telling our children this now? That you're going to discover a lot of things and you're going to learn a lot of things, but nothing's going to be sweeter. Nothing's going to give you more life, health, wealth, and vitality than the words of God. So from ages 6 to 10, the little Hebrew children would memorize the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Have you read those books? Especially Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would memorize not just the names of the book, but the words found within the books. Now, a lot of people, when we start talking like this, will say, you know what? There's no way kids can handle that today. And I'm telling you, yes, they can. Yes, they can. The truth is, it's not a matter of priority for us because we don't see this book as the words of life. If you saw this book as truly the words of life, to give your child health, wealth, and prosperity, I promise you, you would find a way. If you truly believe that, you would find a way to get these words into your children starting at age six and beyond. But besides that, I've heard six-year-old children singing songs by Britney Spears, and uh, I know she's old news, but I've heard uh, six- or seven-year-olds mouthing words to songs that are so fast, and yet somehow they've made their way into their memory. And it's because in the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, these are the formidable years your kids learn and absorb everything. So by the age of 10, you would have completed Bet Sefer. The best of the best students would continue on. By the way, one of the other practices they did is little children would wear, remember the phylacteries where you would take scriptures of verse and you would bind them to your forehead and to your wrist? Well, the children wouldn't necessarily bind them to their forehead, but they would always have scriptures on their wrist, bound to their wrist. I just wonder what would happen today if we had our kids, six to ten years old, walking around with little bracelets that were scripture rather than something that is either material or something that makes absolutely no contribution to the spiritual health of their lives. So after you graduated from, from uh, stage one, you went to stage two when you were ten years old. It was called Bet Talmud. And in Bet Talmud, you would memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures all the way to the Italian prophet Malachi, right? No, all the way to Malachi. So think about this. By the age of 14, you would have memorized the entire Hebrew text, all the Old Testament. Wow. Uh, when I went to seminary, I was in Cincinnati uh, Christian University. And right across the street, you could actually walk to a, a, over a bridge and arrive at Hebrew Union University. And the first time we took a tour, I wanted to go there because I wanted to see the Holocaust Museum, which was always quite, uh, which was also quite reputable. When we walked over, we saw in display this huge, big Hebrew Bible. I mean, it was amazing. And the guide explained to us how students, before they got into Hebrew Union Seminary, had to memorize the Hebrew Bible. That was one of your entrance feet, one of your entrance requirements. You got to be able to sit and memorize and recite the entire Old Testament. And the reason is, is because when they began their education in seminary, the class was designed to discuss the words and the meaning of the Old Testament. And I remembered listening to him talking about how they learned at Hebrew seminary and the difference the way we learned at Cincinnati Christian Seminary. So I had a professor by the name of Dr. Johnny Presley, great professor, but he would create tension in seminary, some kind of tension, and then he would give us the Bible answer, explain it to us, and then when we had exams, he would restate the tension, give us a chance to answer and solve the tension, based on the things that we had learned. So basically, if you're doing math, he would say, what is two plus two? And we would say four, right? But you would do it in essay form. In Bet Talmud, rabbinical teaching, their methods completely different. Because if you could answer a question with another question, it would show two things. It shows one, that you really understood the material or the question, and two, that you'd taken the information to the next level. For instance, if I'm being quizzed on something in the Old Testament, and I'm in... Uh, I, well, let's just say I'm in Bet Talmud or at Hebrew Union Seminary. If the question is, what is two plus two? I'm not going to say four. I'm going to say, what is 16 divided by four, which is also four. I'm going to answer a question with a question. And that means that I truly understand what's happening, at least in philosophical terms in the text. That also explains Luke chapter two, verse 46. After three days, they found him, that is Jesus in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. So they asked Jesus a question, and he does so with another question, and the answers and the questions he's given them show them that he is very well versed in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus, how old was he when this happened? He was 12 years old. 12. And he was in what school? He was in Bet Talmud. Question and answers. 
In fact, most Jewish girls by the age of 13 were not only betrothed, that doesn't mean they were married, it just means they were promised, engaged, but they were also by the age of 13 in Bet Talmud. Even girls, that's right. So it should be no surprise that when Mary hears the news that she's going to bear the Christ child, that she breaks out in Psalms and minor prophets. I mean, the Magnificat is amazing. It's just one Old Testament quote after the next because she would have been familiar with it even at age 13. Another important note, let's keep going here. Each rabbi in the day of Jesus, there were hundreds of rabbis, they would have a certain way of applying the text of the Old Testament. There would be considerable agreement on what the text meant, but the application would vary. In other words, here's what the text means, but how do I apply that into my everyday life? So one rabbi might come along and say, you know what, to keep the Sabbath means this, this, and that. But another rabbi might come along and say, well, yeah, it means this. I take your point, but I think it also means this, this, and that. So each rabbi would have his own particular set of, particular set of rules and regulations uh, that were to be lived out if the Torah was the Old Testament, the, fi- the first five books of the law, were to be upheld in one's life. And that particular set of rules and regulations would be called his yoke. Now, that's Y-O-K-E, not Y-O-L-K. We're not talking about the, the middle of an egg or Y-O-L-K, rather. So the yoke, Y-O-K-E, is the wooden harness that allows two animals to work closely together side by side. And the reason a rabbi's yoke was called yoke because you were to take the precepts and his particular applications into your life, and they were supposed to work together in yours. So when you follow the rabbi, you would take the rabbi's yoke upon you, his understanding of the Torah, the biblical precepts, principles, and how to apply them pragmatically into your life. You would apply that into daily living. Now, the main rabbi, our rabbi, Jesus, he says this in Matthew 11, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So time out just a moment. How is Jesus' yoke easy? And of course, you and I know that because Jesus tells us that those who love God will do his work. But the work of the Father is what? To believe in the one he sent. In all the other rabbis, there's a long list of do's and don'ts to become holy or righteous. But our rabbi Jesus says everything that needed to make you holy and righteous has been done or will be done on the cross of Jesus Christ. Our rabbi says, I am about to become the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world, past, present, future. So my yoke is easy, and that is believe on me and the things that you need that I will and have provided. If you're the best of the best in Bet Talmud, and you've already graduated from Bet Sefer, now you are in the elite class, Bet Talmud. By the age of 14, you've memorized the entire Old Testament, You can either, you can enter into intelligent discussions. So you're the Harvard or the Yale or the Princeton of the scriptures. Otherwise, you got to go back to UCLA. I know that's not going to sit well with most of you. But then guess what happens? You go to stage three, Bet Midrash. Now at the age of 14 or 15, you present yourself to the rabbi. It's a big day in the life of a Jewish child. So you say to the rabbi, Rabbi, I have come and I want to be your disciple, your Talmud, your student or apprentice. The rabbi would say, okay, have a seat. Uh, The questions and the answers would begin. Let's give you a little test here. Let's see if you're the best of the best. And it starts with the basics. Like the rabbi might say something like, on what day of creation did the earth bring grass? And of course, you and I know that's day three, but you wouldn't say three. You would say, what is the number of days Jonah remained inside the great fish? You would answer the question with another question. So it goes on and on. If the rabbi decides this student is the best of the best, that he was the cream of the crop, and he was far more capable of spreading the rabbi's yoke, then the rabbi would simply say these words to him. Come, follow me. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. It starts with one church at a time, getting serious about what we're doing and how we're training the next generation and what we're pouring into them that they would go against the grain of culture so that they can walk their entire lives in the dust of the rabbi. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are 
Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.